Well, it's good to see all of you, and let me begin by expressing my thanks to you for the invitation to be here with you today and to share with you a few things about the Word of God. I always love speaking about God's Word uh, to people, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity this morning. Um, when Don first told me about this study, he said it's a thing that we do for men, men only, and it concentrates and focuses on how we as men might be better servants of the Lord. And I got to tell you that um, this kind of topic uh, is not one that I myself have visited a lot personally. Uh, of course, I'm always trying to think about my own life with Jesus and my relationship with the Lord. Uh, but to think about uh, as a man, uh, that, that presented kind of a challenge to me. And uh, some of you may know that I teach at Florida College, and I'm, I'm used to some more kind of academic kinds of approaches. So this one, uh, it took me a while to really think about what, what could we do to think about uh, our work as men. And I, and I came up with this idea, and I hope that it is helpful for you today. Uh, it is simply titled, Men of the Word, Men of God. And I don't know if that really kind of conjures up any kind of image to you, but what I'd like for us to think about for a little bit this morning is a particular designation of some people in the Bible uh, and what that might mean for you and I. Uh, we'll begin with asking a very simple question. What is it that God expects from us? And we could put a finer point on that. What is it that God expects from us, particularly as men. And I always like to go back to some of the more basic fundamental things because once we've got those things down, we can talk about other things as well. But if you want to turn your Bible with me to the book of Romans, chapter 12, this is a very familiar text. Uh, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. There, there right there in the book of Romans, Paul kind of puts his finger on a lot of things. Uh, I think in the context, Paul is putting his finger on what's going to help the church at Rome right there, how they're going to solve their problem. Uh, but it turns out that how to solve their problem is really how to solve all problems. And this is the thing that all Christians need. This is where we start. Whatever we're doing, whatever place we are at in our spiritual growth, whatever difficulty we're facing, this is kind of where we have to be grounded. And later on, in, or previously, excuse me, in Romans chapter 6, if you want to go back up there, uh, Paul uses what must have been some pretty, pretty shocking language, some pretty radical stuff. Paul says uh, in Romans 6.15, What then, shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience... You are the slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Uh, in the ancient world, uh, to call somebody a slave... Uh, was not a compliment. I mean, slaves were the lowest people in the ancient world. They were at the bottom of every totem pole. And nobody wanted to be a slave unless it was just some kind of exceptional circumstance that you just had to go through it. But given the choice, nobody wanted to be a slave. And yet Paul says that's, that's what we have all become. We have become slaves. We're that dedicated. We are that tied to Jesus. We are that under his control, under his reign. As a slave is bound to do what his master tells him to do and use his body for the master's will. Paul says that's what we are. We are slaves of our Lord. 
What the Lord wants from us is to be dedicated and committed, to be wholly under his lordship and his reign. And one of the questions uh, that we can ask is, what does this look like? If we want to put a, a picture to the image or a picture to the idea, uh, what might we think about? And I realize there are lots of answers to that question, but what I'd like to do uh, right up front here is I would like to uh, kind of introduce an idea. And it is not my intention to lecture to you for the next uh, hour or, or whatever we're here for. Um, I'd like for us to discuss these things. I'd like for us to talk about some things and explore some ideas together. So I want, want to get you involved in our, uh, our, our lesson this morning in a very, very active way. But let me begin uh, with this idea. Let, let's start with being men of the word. And if you want to go to Psalm 1, uh, and you know, where, where we could start with a topic like this, of course, there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, I'm just telling you that personally, as far as my life and my experience is concerned and, and how I try to help other people and teach other people, that for me, it all goes back to the word. That I need to be filled up with God's word. There's a lot of other things I need to. There's a lot of other things that, that are useful. But first and foremost, I need to be in the Word. There's really no substitute for that. There's, there's no getting around that. This is a familiar psalm. Uh, David says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. I'd like for us just to think for a moment about what this text is saying to us. That, uh, we, here, here's a man uh, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law, he meditates day and night. There's a picture that the author is painting here of somebody who has God's word constantly on their mind. And I don't know any of you uh, at all. Very, very few of you uh, in any way at all know Don and Jeremy. Maybe you've met uh, one or two other of you at, at some time. But, uh, but I don't know your lives. I don't know what kind of uh, people you are, what kind of habits you have. And so it may be that this exhortation is something you're already doing, and if that's the case, that's, that's great. But let me encourage you that this is the picture that all of us need to be, that this is where being a man starts, that I need to get filled up with God's word. I need to have his word on my mind constantly, and, and, and I realize that you know, at work, you've got things that you have to concentrate on. There's a problem. There's a fire you've got to put out here. This person needs to be talked to. This work needs to be done. I realize that. But I'm talking about the kind of thing that when we go to talk to somebody or when something happens and I have to react to that, that the first thing that comes to my mind is, what would God want me to do here? What does God's word say about me in this situation? That's the idea I think that David might be getting at here, meditating on God's word day and night. It doesn't mean you're sitting in a room and doing nothing else but meditating. This is the kind of thing we can do while we're doing everything else. Driving our car, uh, doing our work, shopping for groceries, helping our wives wash dishes, whatever it might be. This is the kind of thing that we can say, you know, I've, got a, I've got God's word on my mind. James uses a, a really fascinating little picture here. I've got James chapter 1 in verse 21 on the screen there. This is, this is a, a little idea that I, I just keep coming back to personally. Uh, James says, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted. Does somebody's Bible translation say something other than implanted there? Okay. Engrafted. 
Uh, you know the idea about grafting a limb onto a tree? You cut a notch into that tree and you cut a V-shaped uh, end on that branch and you stick it down in there and you bind it together and that branch and that tree then will actually grow together when you graft things together. That's the picture that James is using here, that I get that into me. I get connected to it. Or it becomes implanted, as the New American Standard says. Uh, and it's what Jesus called hearing. Remember that little phrase that Jesus used all the time? He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Because there were a lot of people in Jesus' day who heard the sounds that Jesus made from his mouth but they didn't get the message. And the reason they didn't get the message is because they weren't open. They weren't hungering and thirsting. They weren't like the people described in the song we sang, like the deer panting after God. Uh, they just wanted to hear something. They wanted to hear what they wanted to hear, but they weren't ready to listen to what God had to say. And therefore, Jesus kept saying to them, get your ears open. He that has ears to hear, then he should hear this. And that's the kind of people we need to be, people who have ears to hear. Uh, going back to our text there in the psalm, um, the psalmist says that this will make us strong and stable, that he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. You've been out in the woods. I know all of you, most of you, uh, when I was a boy, used to go to the grandparents' farm and go down to the creek, and you know, the trees growing by the creek are the big, strong ones, and they're not going to move. They are implanted there firmly. That's the picture here, that, that we have become strong because we have taken in the word of God. And the author says that this tree will bear its fruit in its season, its leaf does not wither, using the imagery there that this is a tree that does not wax and wane. You know, it's not strong one time and weak the other. Its leaves are always growing, kind of like a, almost a, an image there of the, the tree of life that is constantly blooming. And then the author says what that means is that he's always doing something and he is succeeding at it. That being people of the word will cause us to bear fruit. Uh, somebody please turn to Matthew 13, 23 and have that ready. Uh, if somebody else would please turn to Colossians 1 and verse 10. And then uh, the two other passages there. If I could uh, have you read those. Who's got Matthew 13, 23? Yes, sir, please. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands. So the familiar parable of the sower, right? The seed falls into the ground like the word falling into our hearts. That's that engrafted word that James was talking about. And it makes us bear fruit. And, and the end of that verse again said some of it, what was it? 30? 100, 60 or 30 times. Yeah, 30, 60 or 100 times. Um, I'm not a, a farmer. Any farmers in the room here? Anybody know what modern crop yields are? Something, somebody told me that, that, uh, that maybe a 20%, 120% a uh, is good, like you can get 120% of the seed that you planted. Uh, Jesus says, no, 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 twice that much. And what, the point I'm making is that the figures that Jesus is using there were just absolutely phenomenal. Nobody grew crops like that in the ancient world. And yet Jesus says, this will make you tremendously, tremendously fruitful. Who's got Colossians 1.10? Jeremy? So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good word, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Bearing fruit in every good work. The good works that we do are the fruit that's coming out of us. And that fruit is the direct result of the word, the seed that's been planted deep in our hearts. Hebrews 6, 7, who's got that one? Yes, sir. The wind that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful for those for whose sake it is cultivated is called the blessing from God. 
the author there is telling the, uh, the readers of Hebrews, what are you doing with what God has given you? Uh, these are people who were thinking about quitting. And the author in the next verse says, don't be like the, the seed that never produces anything, that, that you've got this seed and God gives you the rain. He gives you all this opportunity to produce fruit. But in the next verse, it only produces thorns and thistles. What do you do with a field that produces thorns and thistles? The author says you burn it. But the seed that produces the good fruit, having received the rain that is useful for other people, that receives a blessing. Who's got Galatians 5, 22 and 23? Another familiar text. Yes, sir. Against such, uh, I always like to point out about that passage that that's not an exhaustive list. The nine things that Paul mentioned there are not the only things that can be coming out of us. Paul says things like this. And you'll notice that Paul uses the singular word fruit, not the fruits, but the fruit. It, it's, it's a package. It, this is the stuff that comes out of us, stuff like this. It, it's all part of the same kind of thing. And again, my point is that this is what we become like when we become people of the word. Uh, one of the worst things I think we can do, and that anybody can do, is try to act like a Christian without being a Christian. I think you know what I mean by that. That, that sometimes people will say, well, here's what God wants me to do. He wants me uh, to practice love, and he wants me to be happy, and you, know, you go through that list of the fruit of the Spirit and say, i got to do this, this, and this, but that misses the point, doesn't it? That's not a list of things to do. It's a list of things to be, and, and we can't be those things without the Word having first been implanted in our hearts. And so being men of the Word is where it begins. If you want to go to with me to Psalm 119, Psalm 119, that wonderful meditation on God's word. I'd like for us to look at just a few things that uh, the author says there. Uh, look in verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. And we hear that phrase, how can a young man keep his way pure? And if you're like me, you're saying, well, that." That's not me, right? I'm, an, I'm not a young man. There are some young men in the group today, but there's a couple of us that would say, well, that's not me. Uh, in the biblical way of thinking, uh, you are a young man until you are about 60 years old. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's still most of us in this room, right? So uh, being a young man means you still have your strength, that you know, you're, you're not bedridden, you're not... Uh, unable to walk, that kind of thing. So this is really a, a text about us. Uh, look in verse 11, two verses down. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Verse 16, I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. Skip on down to verse 42. So I will have an answer for him who reproaches me for I trust in your word. Verse 50, this is my comfort in my affliction that your word has revived me. Skipping down to verse 133 in that lengthy psalm. Establish my footsteps in your word and do not let iniquity have dominion over me. In verse 148, my eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. I, I really like that verse. Um, of course, in the ancient world, uh, men work during the daytime and you study the Bible at night. That may be one of the reasons that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because that's when people studied the Bible. And it's also, though, the time when you lie down and you take a rest from the day and you think about some things that maybe you couldn't think about. And, and the author says here, I can't wait until the sun goes down so that I can just spend time thinking about God's word. My eyes anticipate the night watches. 
because that's when I get to concentrate on God's word. And then in verse 162, I rejoice at your word like one who finds great treasure or spoil. And there's a picture that is developed in the Bible that being people who just love God's word, that I just love it and I want to take it in. I want to know everything uh, that there is to know about it. I want to hear it all. I want to read it all. I want to think about it. I want it to be inside me. Being men of the word, I would suggest, is where it starts. And that leads us to the companion idea that I'd like for us to consider for most of our time today, and that is being men of God. There are, of course, hundreds of characters in the Bible, but interestingly, only a handful of them, there's only about 12 people in all the Bible who are called men of God. And I think you could make the argument that, well, there are other people who could be called men of God, uh, but aren't, and that certainly is true. But even if you were to cast the net a little wider, you know, you know, some of the prophets are called men of God, some of them aren't. Let's say, well, well, all the prophets could be called men of God. Okay, so maybe now we've got 24 people instead of 12 people in the Bible, right? Or maybe we've got 50 people in the Bible that could be called men of God. The point is still that this phrase isn't used of a whole lot of people, relatively speaking. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 35, does somebody have that text available? Jeremiah 35 and verse 4. Just go ahead and read it if you got it. I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the room of the sons of Hanan, son of Ezekiah, the man of God. Yeah, now who is this guy? I have no idea. He's never mentioned again in the Bible as far as I know. He is in the house of the Lord, so he is obviously associated with the priests in some way, and yet the Bible says that this Hanan, the son of Igdalia, is the man of God. I wish I knew more about him, that he is called that. The phrase is used of men who were especially close to God. Man of God means a man dedicated to God, a man who belonged to God in a way that was unusual, in a way that was at a level perhaps beyond the normal, somebody whose life was wrapped up with God. And that's what I'd like for us to just think about uh, for a little bit today. And, and having kind of shared with you these fundamental ideas, I'd like for us now to to turn to a couple places where this phrase is used, and I'd like to open up and, and hear some things from you. Uh, we'll begin with the fact that several, not all, but several of the prophets of the Old Testament are called men of God. So let me just ask you, when you think about the prophets of the Old Testament, what are the qualities of those men that come to your mind? The qualities that they have. Anybody? Yes, sir? Oh, you're just scratching your nose. Kind of like an auction. You know, if you do this or that, you've got to buy something. <laughs> but he wanted perseverance. Perseverance. Yes. Do you have any particular prophets that you're thinking of when you say that? Jeremiah suffers quite a bit, doesn't he? It's in a difficult situation. Warning the people. Yeah, man, that, that really comes to mind, doesn't it? That, and what's he warning people? How does he do that? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah, you've got it exactly. That, 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 that God sends them into these situations that are messed up morally and in terms of the covenant and everything else. And, and God says to the prophet, you tell them what I said, right? That these men of God are men of the word. But that's what God says to them, that you're going to be my spokesman to these people. And that causes them a lot of difficulty, right? I mean, we've all had opportunities and experiences of trying to tell somebody about Jesus or the gospel and we've met with hostility, right? You ever had a door slammed in your face or, or somebody say, listen, I, I don't want you talking to me about Jesus or about that church over there? Yeah, that's the situation they were into. Yes, sir. Think about difficulty Yeah. Poor, poor Jeremiah. Uh, you mentioned Jeremiah. Remember the early chapters of Jeremiah there? And in Isaiah as well, God says, listen, I'm going to send you to these people. I want you to know up front, nobody's going to listen to you. How would, how would you feel about that? God said, listen, i got a job for you to do. Uh, it's it's going to be to talk to other people. Now, now nobody's going to listen to you, but I want you to talk to them anyway. Wow, what a difficult situation. Jeremiah preached for 23 years, and there is no indication that anybody paid any attention to him at all. Courageous. Courageous. I mean, courageous. I mean, even though many of them really didn't necessarily <clears throat> want to do it, when they did it, they did it wholeheartedly. They went into it and, yeah. and were courageous about what they said, even though they knew it. Again, I think about Jeremiah with what you just mentioned there. Remember Jeremiah's reaction when God calls him? You got the wrong guy, God. I'm, I'm just a kid, right? And God says, oh, no, you're exactly the guy. And it's tough. Don, you got your hand up. It's along this line, but they, they were truly uh, a minority. Almost to the, you know, the righteous remnant and everything else is picked up by Paul. But the idea of perceiving that you are never going to Never going to be the majority, going to be outcast from your own people. How tough that was. What are some other things you think of when you think about the prophets? What qualities did they have? Anything else? Yes, sir. I think mean, about how they were picked from kind of a lowly state and propelled into a higher state by God. In other words, it didn't come from the you know, tribes of Levi. Uh, they weren't, you know, elders, you know, you know, they weren't the top tier of like, yeah. the conservative religious society, mm -hmm. but God chose them anyway to be a mouthpiece. Yeah. And one of the prophets is a dresser of sycamore trees, right? He's a, he's a gardener. Uh, kind of interesting to see who God picks to be prophets, because, yeah, like you say, uh, he doesn't pick men from the upper class of their day. He doesn't pick men from the royal household. Uh, household. Uh, Isaiah is in an interesting situation. Isaiah seems to be able to go and talk to the king pretty easily. So Isaiah may have been a rich man, but uh, otherwise God picks people who are pretty obscure, right? And they show up one day and they tell the king, you're not doing right. And the king's like, who are you and where did you come from, right? Uh, yes, uh, so lowliness, all of that. Any other thoughts here? Some things about the prophets. Other thoughts? Let me just share with you the list that, that came to my mind. Uh, we've got men like Samuel. He's called a man of God. Shemaiah, the prophet Shemaiah. Uh, the unnamed prophet in 1 Kings 13. I always think it's interesting when there's a prophet with no name in the Bible. Uh, you remember this is the story about the split of Solomon's kingdom. Jeroboam has started the golden calves up in the northern kingdom. And God sends a prophet. And God says uh, to this prophet, remember, don't come back the way you came. Don't eat any bread. Don't drink anything while you're there. Go deliver the message and get out. And so the man of God comes in and he curses the altar that Jeroboam has built. And ultimately this prophet disobeys God and, and himself gets killed. But 
kind of interesting that he's not named. It's kind of like the Bible writer's way of saying his name isn't important here, okay? It's what he was. It's what he did that we want to concentrate on. Elijah and Elisha are both called man of God. And so uh, my list looks a lot like the list that you just created. I think about Elijah on Mount Carmel, how zealous for God he was. He said to the prophets of Baal, okay, let, let's, let's figure out who's going to be God in this country. You build your altar, I'll build mine. You call on your God, you call on mine. And whoever wins, their God is the God of Israel. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. Um, let me go there lest I misquote something. Um, This is the story, of course, of, of Elijah being taken to heaven. And the thing that kind of stands out about this is you remember that uh, Elijah says uh, that if you are with me uh, today, then, then you'll be blessed. And Elisha says, well, I'm not going to leave you. And the two of them went on. And remember what it was that Elisha wanted I want a double portion of your spirit, Elijah. And here's a man who loved the Lord, and he said, Elijah, you've done a great job. I mean, Elijah is one of those characters in the Bible that he's like the Apostle Paul. He just gets all of this mistreatment, and yet he's, he's still serving God. And Elisha says, I want even more. I want to be an even greater servant than that. Zealous for God. Uh, Somebody mentioned men who spoke the word of God. That was their core work. Men who led others to turn to God and serve God. You remember when Samuel uh, comes along? It's a very difficult time in Israel's history, the period of the judges. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. But Samuel comes along and says, no, no, no. This is, we can't have a nation of people like this. And he turns the people to the Lord and they get their victories against the Philistines. Uh, that's what a man of God does. He's a leader who brings other people to God. I think about uh, the story in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13. Let me go back to that text there. 1 Kings 13, the, the man of God that we just talked about the, uh, who is sent to warn King Jeroboam about the evil that he is about to do. You know, we talk about that kind of thing, and yet it's hard for us to imagine how difficult that job must have been. Uh, we live in a country where there's a president, and you can write the president a letter or send him an email. If you were very fortunate, you might even get you know, to meet him someday or talk to him. But in the ancient world, if, if you had a problem, and you said, well, i got to go talk to the king. You go up to the king's palace, and there's a gate there, and the guard says, hey, i got to go talk to the king. You know what they're going to say to you? You're not going to talk to the king. You don't talk to the king. Other people, uh, people higher up the chain can talk to but not you. And, and for a prophet, one of these people that was mentioned is kind of a nobody to walk in and say, king, what you're doing is wrong. And to say that to a king in the ancient world, that... That was dangerous stuff to do. And yet the prophets did that. Men through whom God's power worked, vehicles for God's blessing. So I think about the story there in uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, where uh, Elijah uh, goes to the, the widow of Zarephath and raises her son when he dies. And we have a similar story in 2 Kings chapter 4 uh, of the, the work there, if I'm thinking about the right story, of Elisha when he comes to the village and uh, multiplies the widow's oil there. Uh, the man of God was a man that God used to bless other people. But let's move on. Uh, one of the men who is called man of God in the Bible is Moses. And so let me again ask you, when you think about Moses, what qualities come to your mind? What kind of man is Moses? Humble. Humble, yeah. 
Uh, it says there in the book of Numbers that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Moses lived with a very contentious people. Did they, they complained and they were after him all the time. And Moses was very meek about that. What are some other things about Moses? Think about his life. Think about what he went through. Pardon? Brave, brave. brave. In what way? How, how does he show brave? Like you're saying, you have a full sense of the terror and self service that she. Yeah. The, the hard thing to do. And uh, you remember the story of Moses. Uh, he tries to deliver the, the Israelites from the Egyptians, which leads them up and winds up killing the Egyptian. Gets found out and he has to leave Egypt. Moses said, I, I, can't, I can't live there anymore. I've got to go someplace where they're not trying to cut my hair off, right? And then he meets God, and God says, What? Go back to the place where there's the death water. Talk about murder. Yeah. What are some other things about him, Moses? Yes, sir. I was thinking about very, very wandering, how often he defended his people before God. Yes. Yeah, there's that famous story in. Exodus 32. Remember Moses up on the mountain getting the law from God and the Israelites are down there making the golden calf. And Moses comes down and sees it and God says, okay, Moses, that's it. I've had it. Stand back. I'm going to kill them all right now. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. We're going to start all over again. And Moses is all God who can't do that. Right? Please, please don't do that. It, it, it would be that would be horrible. God relents. God was, God was ready to just, he had had enough to hear with the Israelites. It's only Exodus chapter 32, right? There's a lot of the story left. And God says, I can't take this anymore. And Moses interceded. Yes. What are some other things about Moses? Pretty dedicated. Pretty dedicated. Think about it. His whole life was consumed from that point on of working on behalf of the Lord. Yes. Yeah. But he's even in spite in the fact the fact that you're reflecting on what it really means to be a man of God doesn't mean that we can hide behind our shortcomings and our failures and still not reach greater potential by Moses did. You make an extremely good point. And somebody else made that point a moment ago that men of, to be a man of God doesn't mean you're gonna be perfect, right? Moses does fail in, in a couple pretty spectacular ways. Jeremiah and you watch Jeremiah break down and cry in front of God. I can't do this anymore. And God says, get up and go preach. You know, uh, Elijah tends to get worn out sometimes. And so, yes, you're, you're exactly right. We're not saying here that men of God are perfect men, but there is a picture here that I think we're, we're seeing develop here of qualities and character traits. Uh, some other things. What about Moses? What? comes to mind about Moses, anything? I think he loved his people. I mean, I think, I think all through the Egyptians kill him. And then you know, he's standing there uh, protecting them when they uh, worship the idols. Yeah. He, he really does love the people of God. I was going to say, it's just like with the prophets, they don't just speak the word, but they kind of embody the word. Uh, you know, Ezekiel acts out the siege and, and all of this. And Moses acts out the judgments of God. And so they're kind of a picture to the people of God's character, God's intentions, uh, his working in the world. And uh, so uh, not just telling the word, but being the word in, in, yeah. a, in a real visceral sense, I guess. Yeah. And that's one of the things that gets them so rejected, right? Because to see what God's word looks like in action, yeah, sometimes people don't like that. Again, I got a lot of the things that uh, you have 
Uh, I thought about serving at a time in his life that was not easy. Uh, how old was Moses when God called him at the burning bush? Anybody remember? 80, 80 years old, yeah. Uh, I'll be lucky if I get to 80. I can't imagine if I turn 80 that God says, okay, now we're going to start the hard work in life, right? And Moses spends the next 40 years while he's an old man, a very old man, uh, doing this kind of work. Uh, some of you mentioned how dedicated Moses was. I, I kind of see that here as well. Uh, I thought about Exodus 3 and 4. Uh, Moses is a lot like Jeremiah, except worse in some ways. Remember, Moses is at the burning bush. Uh, Moses, go back to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And Moses says, oh, oh, no, 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 no. First of all, who am I? Uh, I can't do that. And uh, I have no idea who you are. They're going to ask me what God sent you, and I'm, I don't even know your name, God. And, and then th they're probably not even going to listen to me. And, and I don't speak very well anyway. And you really do have, and remember all of those excuses. God says, no, I'm going to give you a sign. Here's my name. Take Aaron. And, and after a while, Moses is just, I just really don't know. And, and there in Exodus 4, God says, just go. <laughs> I will be with you. Stop the excuses, right? But Moses had to learn that, that, that we can do God's work with God's power. Uh, he handle, he has the right vision and priorities. I think about what is said about him in Ex or Hebrews 11, how he chose to suffer ill treatment with the people of God rather to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. As somebody mentioned, he loved uh, his people and he was willing to uh, intercede for them on occasions. He handles opposition from the Israelites. He was meek. He was long-suffering because he loved other people. And again, we could probably make the list even longer. Another man in the Bible who is called a man of God is David. What qualities did David have? What's the first one we think of? Man after God's own heart. Yeah. That's, that's how David is remembered. Uh, the man after God's own heart. He loved God. And even when he sinned against God, he, his heart pained him. Uh, you've all read Psalm 51, the expression of David's repentance after he sinned with Bathsheba. Create in me, O Lord, a new heart and a pure heart. Wash me, David, asks God. Um, in 2 Samuel uh, 24, after he sins against God there, he turns to the Lord in penitence. Uh, he is dedicated over and over again. We won't look at all these passages, but he, he mentions his love for the Lord, his dedication to the Lord numerous times. There is no Psalm 199, obviously. That should be Psalm uh, 99, not Psalm 199. Uh, but what else about David? Yeah, it is unbelievable. It's, it's a great story, isn't it? I mean, I don't know exactly how old David was. Some people say that David might have been around 15, 16 years old, something like that. Which makes that even more amazing. And you remember how his brothers treated him? David said, I'm going to cut his head off. Yeah, I'm going to kill this. And they're like, oh, David, come on, you're, 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 not, you're not old enough. You're, you're, not, you're just a kid. You know, go, go back home to your dad. But David's a man of faith. Almost, uh, he looks naive almost, doesn't he? But, but that's what his faith looks like. What else about David? Yes, sir. He refused to take action against Saul, even though he'd been wanting him to. And the reason he did was because he was God's anointed. Yes. More than one occasion, he had an opportunity to kill Saul. And he wouldn't do it. That's an amazing thing in the ancient world. You, the, the guy who's hunting you down, trying to kill you, you got a chance to take him out, and David said, nope, I'm not going to do it. What else? What are some things about David? Jeremy? Think about how submissive he was to uh, God's will. One example, when he was, uh, uh, he was 
praying in the morning over uh, over his son being lost, and then and the son dies, and he's he's accepting of that, and goes and washes his face, and carries on with his his, uh, with his duties, and he's uh, accepting God's judgment there, and uh, being content with what God has done. That's a good point. That's hard to do, isn't it? David's being really honest right there, right? This is, I did this. This is the consequences of my sin. Yes, sir. I, I like you, as a king, you always want to concur with what God wanted to drag off. You always want to concur with the options that you had. Provide an encouragement to figure out what the right action is. Yeah. Don? And since he's the sweet psalter, he's very expressive of his faith in God, even though he's a valiant warrior. Still a musician that has that ability to express himself. Yeah. Uh, um, kind of thinking like this, he has a personal relationship with God. Um, not just about his words, about him affecting him. I mean, that's what the songs are all about. Yes. Him talking to God and him expecting to get you know, a response back, whether good or bad, but him connecting with God. And Yes, I think you're exactly right. Both those comments are are exactly on target. That that David is connected with God very deeply, and it, and his his love for God and his praise for it just pours out of him, doesn't he? He's not the kind of guy that just sit there to to be this anonymous follower of God, but but everything about him shouts out praises to God. My list again is just like yours. Uh, he's a man of prayer. You think about the Psalms of lament. When David's in trouble, his enemies are against him. What does David do? He calls on God. And when God fixes things and things are good, David does, doesn't just pray to God when times are bad. He praises God in the Psalms of praise. We already mentioned uh, David and Goliath, the faith and the courage that he had. Um, somebody also mentioned this, that uh, he is content to let God have his way. He refuses to kill Saul or uh, have Absalom killed. It's not David's intention for Absalom to, to be killed for his rebellion. And so hopefully we're, we're developing pictures here of what men of God look like. Uh, is it customary to take a break halfway through, Don? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, and how do you mean Okay, I, I kind of plan to, to, to take a break at that point right there. Any questions about any of the characters we've talked about so far? Are there any other points to add? Yes, sir. One other one came to mind. We may have touched on very lightly. We think about the prophet who was Moses facing uh, the resistance from those who were the evil counterparts, but they also faced resistance from within. So, like the people of God, the Israelites, Dealing with each other can be difficult. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. I think about the David in front of him, and he said, with that, how quickly he repented. Yeah. He didn't sit there and argue with Nathan the prophet, did he? Yeah. Oh, no, did Nathan? You got it wrong. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much for your participation. We're going to talk about another man of God when we come back from the break and try and tie some things together. I praise you with all of my life.